Welcome to the Ardent Archives, a ministry of North Clay Baptist Church. Here we explore the writings of church history in order to edify and equip the saints in their ongoing discipleship. In this series, we are reading and discussing The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Written in the late 1600s, The Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of the Christian life, following the main character, Christian, on his journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city. More than any other work in the history of the church, The Pilgrim's Progress captures both the struggles and joys of living the Christian life in a way that is not only accurate, but enjoyable to read. So prepare yourself for an epic adventure as we embark on The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Hello again, and welcome back to the Ardent Archives. We are certainly very excited to be back here with you discussing another book, discussing The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. I am uh, one of your hosts, Pastor Drew Bieber, and I'm here with my co-host, Pastor Josh McDaniel. Josh, it's great to be back here with you again. Um. So happy to be back. This is one of my favorite books. Right. And when I say back here again, I'm not only talking about the fact that we are uh, here for a a second time uh, discussing another book for the Ardent Archives, but full disclosure, actually, we actually discussed this book already and we've actually recorded this introduction or actually failed to record this introduction. Um, We started (laughs) recording and turns out I did not have enough room on my hard drive. And so we just kept talking and the recording cut itself off. And so when I say that we're back here, I mean that we're literally back here again, That's right. doing, but we're, the, but doing we're, the thing we just did about 20 minutes we're ago. We're really good at talking though, <laughs> Drew. So, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to be as hard for us as it will be. Right. Know? Well, and I'm sure that's just some information that nobody really cares about, but I thought it's kind of hilarious. So I figured rather than pretend it didn't happen, might as well just own up to it. Let's go ahead and just but, put it out there in the open. But anyways, we are here and we are discussing the Pilgrim's Progress. Now, the Pilgrim's Progress is a wonderful book. It's a fantastic book. It has a uh, uh, great significance, not only in uh, the church, not only in uh, the history of the church and, and the history of Christianity, but it's also got some some literary uh, uh, significance as well um, and, and history uh, tied to the uh, English language and English literature. Yeah. And so uh, before we kind of jump into uh, some information about this book and before we, we also get into the life of, of John Bunyan, I did want to take a moment to highlight what the significance, uh, the significance of this book to to us personally. And so, Josh, yeah. why don't you go ahead and take us into uh, what this book means to you uh, personally? Yeah. So there are two books that I reread every single year, and one of them is on the incarnation, which we recorded in December, and the other one is this one, uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and so. Every December I read on the Incarnation, but Pilgrim's Progress will pop up at different times in the year. This year it was early on in the January and February months. And so, and one of the reasons why it took so long to read is because we were doing it as an audio book. Right. <clears throat> now, I reread it every year because um, if you have not read it, and if you go through the audio book, this will become painstakingly clear. But the reality is, is that John Bunyan wrote this book and it's an allegory, but it's an allegory he doesn't mask, he doesn't hide whatsoever. Right. The main character's name is Christian, so you don't have to wonder if he's a Christian. In right. the same way you meet uh, Evangelist, and he's an evangelist. What do you know? You, you meet a man named Faithful, and you don't have to wonder, is he going to be faithful up until the end? All these kinds of things are on the nose. You know where they stand, and you know uh, who each character is. Yeah. Now, not only does he name the people in a way that's so obvious, but he names the places and even some of the trials that happen uh, yeah. in uh, just in this on-the-nose, kind of in-your-face way. And for anybody who calls themselves a believer, you can find yourself on this journey, on this pilgrim's progress, as it were, and you can find that no matter what my circumstances, I am somewhere caught up and mixed up in the middle of what Bunyan wrote about. Right, and what right. is so incredible about this is, is Bunyan writes 
just in the most plain way possible, if you're a Christian and if this is who you're with or if this is the circumstance you find yourself in, here is the biblical mindset in approaching these things. Right, right. And it's so helpful. And like I said, I reread this book every year and it's in different times and different stages in my life. And no matter what time of my Christian life I've read this in, I've always found myself somewhere along this journey as a believer, either in my encounters with someone I have at the present time or a trial or situation that I'm in the middle of. Yeah. And so I love this book because every time I read it, even though I've reread it so many times, man, it's fresh and it's new to me because I'm always in a different season of life. I'm always on a different part of the Pilgrim progress. Yeah. Yeah. And I can say for, for me personally, you know, I, um, uh, growing up, I was a homeschooled, uh, shout out to the homeschool crowd. And I actually graduated as a homeschooler. So I'm a, mm. like a true, true blue homeschooler. Mm. But, uh, there was a short period of time, uh, between, uh, I want to say second or third grade and seventh grade that I went to a small private Christian school. Okay. Um, and during that time that I was at the small private Christian school, uh, the curriculum we were doing and everything I had to read the Pilgrim's progress. Yeah. And so I want to say it was either fifth or sixth grade that I read this book. Um, and that was the the first time I was introduced to this book. And really up until we begin recording for this podcast, that was the last time I, no, I, had, okay, I was right. introduced to this book. Right. And so I remember having to read it, uh, but I don't remember really remember anything about it. Um, I can kind of vaguely remember what the cover of the book of this particular edition of the book looked like. And actually I tried to uh, model the artwork for this podcast uh, after what I remember being the cover of the book. It's very seventies, eighties, maybe even early nineties. Yeah. Yeah. And so to be honest, I don't know if it is similar. I actually tried to see if I could find uh, different editions of this book to, to see if it, if you know, it was similar. Uh, but, but in my mind, right, this it looks something like this, kind of the color scheme and the way the letters mm-hmm. are and, and different things like that. And so I, I, I remember the cover vaguely. Um, and throughout the book, there were uh, in this particular edition, there were sketches, sketch art of, of just different things happening throughout the book. Yeah. And the the one sketch that I do have firmly implanted of my mind of is is of Christian climbing the hill towards the cross yes, uh, with the burden on his back and then that burden falling off of his back. Right. And that's it. That's all I rem- remember about this book. And so it has been uh, particularly fun for me recording this book because, you know, I, I read with you as we record just to make sure that, you know, that you're, you're, screw up. you are also <laughs> reading it correctly. That's right. Um, and, you know, and then sometimes it's just good for me to be able to keep pace with you and right. everything like that. And so right. I've actually been reading this afresh as we're recording it. And so I've, I've particularly enjoyed uh, being reacquainted with with this story and, and with this book. And like you said, uh, Bunyan is very, uh, very pointed and he's not trying to hide anything in, in his allegory. Right. Uh, oftentimes when it comes to, you know, allegories, it's 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 hard. You know, first of all. Not that I've read a ton of allegories, but I feel like the right, ones right, that I right, have right. seen, there's um, there's almost not a clear answer as to whether or not it's actually an allegory. Yeah, you have to do a little bit of legwork to right. figure it out. Yeah, it, 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 there's some they're somewhat trying to mask the fact that you no, know, these characters and the story actually represent something else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then even then, even if you can nail down the fact that, no, this is an allegory, it's hard to nail down exactly, okay, well, what represents what? With this book, with The Pilgrim's Progress, there's no question. Right. Uh, Bunyan is clearly trying to say, like you said, that that Christian is a Christian, and he is leaving the city of destruction, which is set to be destroyed for the celestial city. Right. You, you know what I mean? There's just there's so many things that it's just very obvious you know, right. he is evangelized to by an evangelist named evangelist. Right. Right. He meets a man who is named worldly wise man. I wonder, I wonder what this man's character is going to be like with right. a name like worldly wise man. And so it makes understanding what he's talking about very easy. It's very easy to read. Um, and uh, like you said, there's also we can identify with and sympathize with different aspects of this journey. 
uh, as we go through the book, because uh, like you said, we see the progress of the pilgrim. Uh, you know, we see the different stages of his journey and we can say at different points. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. I understand what he's, what he's going through there. Yeah. I understand what he's, what I've he's been talking there. About. I'm right. in the thick yeah. of it right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why I think he's so on the nose and one of the reasons why it's just so plain is because where John Bunyan was when he wrote it, it's a fascinating story, but where he was when he wrote it, he wanted there to be no cloak and dagger whatsoever. Yeah. He wanted it to be painfully obvious what he was communicating. Right, right. And so, like, at the time that he wrote it, I'm going to put it out there as on the nose as it can be because my readers who are going to pick this up, they need to know. Right, absolutely. And before we jump into who John Bunyan was, I wanted to to read this quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon, the the Prince of Preachers, the mm-hmm. great uh, you know British Baptist preacher, and here's what he had to say about John Bunyan. Spurgeon said that if you were to cut him anywhere, that he would bleed Bible. And I think that is nowhere demonstrated more clearly than in this book in particular. Because as you read through this book, you just see how saturated Bunyan was in the scriptures. Um, not only in his uh, uh, his bringing the scriptures to bear on certain situations, but even his handling of certain scriptures, his his um, the way he explains what you know what the scripture says about particular issues, it's just so clearly that this man understood the scriptures. He studied the scriptures. He he made it his life's work to be a student mm-hmm. of the scriptures, and I think that's w- what an awesome testimony, right? Yes. For the prince of preachers. Right, the one, arguably one of the greatest preachers, you know, certainly one of the greatest Baptist preachers, but one of the greatest preachers to ever live. Yeah, since the Apostle Paul. Right, right, yeah. Um, for him to say this about about another individual that he was just so saturated, so seeped in the Scriptures that if you were to cut him anywhere, his blood would be Bible. It should basically. be a desire for all of us to right, have the same right. sentiment about any any one of us. Yeah. And so let's jump into who Bunyan was. Let's jump into sort of some of uh, some of his life and some of the circumstances surrounding yeah. the uh, the writing of this book. Now, this book was written in 1678, right? And there's actually two parts to this book. Now, we only recorded the first part, that's the the part that everyone's familiar with. But there's actually a second part to the yeah. book that was published several years later. And this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, is actually cited as one of the first novels to be published in the English language. Now, there are actually several books that uh, at different points throughout history have been cited as being the first book, the first novel, the first work of fiction to be published in the English language. But The Pilgrim's Progress is among them. And the reason I mention that is because not only does this does this book have significance for the Christian, not only does it have significance um in, in the history of the church, but it also has literary significance uh, and it has historical significance for for English literature, for the English yeah. language. Yeah. And so this book actually has a much wider impact than simply uh, giving shape to the things that we experience as as Christians in our lives. Now, this actually has some some pretty some pretty significant historical impact too for yeah. for the English language that, yeah. that you and I are communicating in today. Right. And up until that point, the biggest or I guess the the bulk way of communicating any kind of narrative or anything like that would be through you know the Shakespearean plays or you know through through works like that that if it was going to be if the if the dialogue was going to drive anything it was going to look and it was going to feel and it was going to sound something more like that yeah but bon- Bunyan when he wrote it um, uh, well first uh, he was born in 1628. And he was born about a mile south of Bedford, England. Now, that's significant that he was born during that time because it's just a few years before the English Civil War, okay? Um, Now, when he was born, his family was very poor. His father was just a tinker. And that just, he would go around and he would do odd jobs here and there. and, and, And he never would put down roots because he would go wherever the work was. Yeah. So... He would go and he would work in this town as a tinker, kind of a, a jack of all trades, uh, you know, but a king of none. And then he'd go to a different town and and he would barely make any ends meet. Uh, now his father, by the time he, this, his dad died, uh, they were so poor 
that John was left only one shilling and his father's tinker's anvil. Wow. So very little in the wa- in the way of worldly goods. Uh, he had very little, if any, formal training uh, in education whatsoever. But he did learn to read. And his favorite thing to read as a young man and as a boy, oddly enough, were medieval romances. Um, Interesting. Where valiant knights, you know, would go through great trials and conquered villains and monsters and stuff like that. So, and maybe that's where we see some things that come up in Pilgrim's Progress. Maybe right, it's where some we of that influence. This, yeah, we might see some of that during the way. Um, but as a youth... Now, he boasted a mouth that was so profane, it would shock even the guys who would be known as kind of the wicked men of these towns, all right? So the drunkards or the sailors or all these kinds of men who would come in town who were known as the wicked men. Like his mouth, even as a youth, was so profane, it shocked even them. Wow. He loved to dance, which is a no-no at the you know around the the Puritan area uh, era. Uh, he would lead Sunday sports, which if you're going to go to church, you're not going to be playing Sunday sports. Well, he was leading them. What does that mean? He's leading people into a wrong thing to be doing on Sundays. He did all kinds of improper things for the for the Puritans around that. Had no. Uh, religious understanding, feelings, anything like that. Yeah. So when he turned 16 in 1644, it's at the height of the English Civil War, and he goes and he joins the war, uh, the army. Okay, he, he goes to join the war effort. And since uh, he was from Bedford, uh, and that was a parliamentarian stronghold. It's probable that he served with Cromwell and for the uh, parliamentarian yeah. objectives and things like that. And so in one particular instance, this is one that he referenced a few times. While he was on duty, he was drawn out to take part in a siege. He His name was called. He was told to go and be a part of this siege effort. But another soldier asked to take his place. Now, this other soldier, as he went and he took Bunyan's place and he goes on this siege, he was shot in the head with a musket bullet and died. And Bunyan often cited this instance as as kind of a, a wow kind of a moment that and he would quote it as a proof that God had spared his life for a great work. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I can say, you know, I, I have a military background. Uh, you know, I have several uncles uh, who were military and law enforcement. My dad was a Marine. I was a Marine. Uh, still am a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Always. Hoorah. Uh, but I'm also now currently in the, uh, the Air National Guard here in, in Birmingham, and thankfully, I've never had to experience war. I've never had to um, actually go and fight on behalf of, of my country. And I'm very thankful for, for that fact up to this point because I do have several friends who, who have been to war. Yeah. Um, and I've heard several stories of, of guys who have, have seen things that have significantly changed them. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I've had several friends who kind of have a similar story to, to Bunyan where they were supposed to go out and they didn't and somebody else went in their place and that guy who went in their place was the one who didn't come back. Um, and it could have been for a number of different reasons. Maybe, um, you know, they sprained their ankle, you know, while they were on off duty, you know, playing football. Yeah. Or, you know, sometimes it was, well, I got sick and so I just couldn't, I just couldn't go out on patrol that day. Or, or similarly to, to Bunyan, you know, somebody just said, hey, I'd, I'd like to go out today. And, and they ended up being the ones who, who didn't yeah. come back. And that had significant impact on, on the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And I, I do find it interesting that, that when Bunyan looks, looks back on this and he reflects on, on that experience, he looks at that and says, no, this is, this is proof of God's providence yeah. and, and of God's you know, sovereignty over my life and him actually uh, uh, preserving me f- for something, to, to do something. Right. And so Bunyan looked on that, thing, on that circumstance, on that, that time in his life, and, and he saw something. Now, he still was a vile pagan, but he saw something 
on his return home, John gets married, and he was about 20 years old-ish when he got married. His wife was just as poor as he was, but they were happy. They were in love. And this father-in-law that he gets, all right, was a godly man. He was a Christian. Yeah. He loved the Lord. And then all of a sudden, here comes John Bunyan, home from war, this foul-mouthed punk, going to marry my daughter. And so guess what she's bringing to the dinner table? <laughs> a mission field. Right, so right. the father-in-law takes the opportunity to give Bunyan some books. Because he knew he'd read them, yeah, and they weren't medieval romances. So he takes, gives him these books. Bunyan reads them. He starts, you know, asking questions. He starts uh, figuring a few things out, yeah. and he gets this sense that he has sinned, that he is doing wrong things, and that that maybe he might even be beyond forgiveness. So what he decides to do is he decides to kind of reform his ways outwardly. Yeah. All right. And so he starts, he stops profaning, you know, or, or cursing as often. He stops doing the Sunday sports leading, you know, all these kinds of things that quits he was dancing, quit smoking, quits dancing, quits all cussing. those kinds of, yeah, all that kind of stuff. He, he kind of outwardly starts putting away things right, that are right. seen as bad. And he kind of thinks he's doing good, but, you know, it's still, there's there's a vast difference between him and his father-in-law. Well, one day he, uh, oh, and he is reading the Bible during this time as well. It's not just a, a couple of like off yeah, chance yeah. books. He is reading the Bible at this time. But one day he overhears these four women speaking of what they would have called an inner religious experience. Now, he'd been doing all this outward work. He had no idea what the inner working of a religious experience could be. Yeah. But he recognizes that all this outward stuff he's doing hasn't changed a thing. He's not anything like his father-in-law. Yeah. And so he goes and he leaves the Church of England. He joins the fellowship where these ladies are. It's a Puritan congregation and he goes with them and he hears about he hears the gospel of Jesus Christ now remember he's been reading the bible he's been reading the word of god yeah. and so with that reading of the word of god he is compelled that he's not doing the work on his own but when he goes and hears the proclamation of the word of god all of a sudden he recognizes where to turn to however it is it is interesting that only after reading luther's commentary on galatians that he realized that he could be justified by faith alone. Right. So yeah. it is it is the reading of God's word combined with the human element, the testimony and the proclamation by human agents that Bunyan is converted. Yeah. And he turns to Christianity. And it's interesting that that's actually how Christian comes about it. He is reading the word of God. He is convicted, but it is through the testimony and it is through the proclamation of a human agent named Evangelist that he turns to the cross of Christ. Right. And I, I do think that that's maybe a nod to his own experience. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, but now Bunyan immediately... Everything shifts. He becomes an open air preacher. He leaves the Church of England, the Anglican Church, and he's going to go and he's going to proclaim the right and the true and the biblical gospel. Yeah. One that doesn't have the Church of England looking over its shoulder and and saying you have to say it this way or that way and mandating all these kinds of things. Right. He's going to go and he's going to preach the counsel of God, right. the Word of God. That's just, what he's going to do. And just real quick for for anyone who's not familiar with with the Anglican Church. Uh, the, the Anglican uh, Church would, I think, rightly be identified as as an uh, an Orthodox, Evangelical, uh, Protestant denomination. But the the Anglican Church is the official state church of England, right? And you know, one of the the 
blessings we have here in the United States is we do have a separation of, of the church and the state. Now, now, that doesn't mean a separation of God in the state. That doesn't mean right. that the church does not have influence in uh, proclaiming uh, God's law and God's gospel uh, to those who, who are in governance over uh, civil matters. But what it does mean is that it recognizes that God has instituted different spheres of authority, namely uh, the, the church as one sphere of authority with particular uh, authority and particular responsibilities, particular duties, as well as the realm and the sphere of the civil authorities. Right now, in when it comes to the Anglican Church and the English civil government, there's there's significant overlap, mm-hmm. and there's actually yes. a, a a a lot of overlap between the civil authority of the English government and the ecclesiastical authority of the Church of England. Yeah, and so. Uh, when you speak of Bunyan leaving the Anglican Church and and not having uh, the government sort of dictating what he can and cannot say, uh, like that's a that's kind of a big deal because there was only one recognized official church in England and that was the right. Anglican Church. And if you were not uh, uh, basically bending the knee to their authority uh, as an ecclesiastical authority, but then also as a civil authority, then you could be in big trouble. Yeah. And Bunyan found himself in that way. Uh, open air preaching became illegal. It became illegal for Bunyan to go out and to preach the counsel of God, for him to preach uh, the cross of Christ, and and because he wasn't Anglican. Yeah. Now Anglicans had free reign to do whatever they wanted to, but but Bunyan could not. And and a lot of the preachers at the time were open air preachers, uh, and they were they were kind of shut down for that. Uh, and they they thought that there was going to be a you know that some of these open air preachers could incite a revolution and stuff like that. And Bunyan never got political yeah. um, even though he was in the civil war he never got political in his preaching why because his cause was not policies or or governments or kings or parliaments right. his cause is the gospel is the gospel so he never really got political in any of his teachings but he was an open-air preacher and he was not under the anglican banner right. so he was warned that he was to be arrested. He was going to be arrested if he held church at a friend's house. Well, he went anyway. <laughs> All right. And Imagine so that. he's determined to set an example of boldness. Uh, and so they, of course, arrest him. They told him they were going to do it. He told him he was going to be there. And so they arrest him. All right. And without a hearing, without witnesses, the judge sentenced John to three months in prison. Wow. Now, he was thrown into uh, Bedford's prison, and those conditions were not the worst in England, but they were still difficult. You know, I mean, yeah. they, it's still a prison. Uh, he was still in there, and there were there was uh, no light, no bathing uh, uh, facilities. It was it you know stunk like unwashed bodies. Yeah, typhus was killing a lot of prisoners at the times. Cells were overcrowded. Uh, he was given a quarter of a loaf of bread a day to eat. So, I mean, he, he had enough to survive. It was certainly not ideal, though. Right, there was nothing right. good about this prison sentence, okay? Uh, but it was not the worst of all prisons. He Just because he didn't suffer the most of anyone ever in prison doesn't mean he didn't suffer. Right. All right? Absolutely. Uh, now, it is worth noting that at this time... Uh, Bunyan's first wife had passed away. Okay. She bore him four children, and now he's remarried, and his second wife is at home taking care of his four children from another wife, from another marriage, right. you know. And, and, and now, now, all of a sudden, he's in prison. Yeah, and now, all of a sudden, he's in prison. So, at the end of three months, John was offered freedom on one condition, just one. All he has to do is agree to this one thing, and he's allowed to go home. All right, and the one condition was this: that he could no longer preach, that oh. he could no longer do it. All right. And after that three month sentence, John wasn't the only one who got that ultimatum. Right. There were other preachers who were thrown in there, and after three months, they were given the same ultimatum. One by one, every other preacher said, "Okay, I'm not going to preach anymore." Yeah. Okay. I'll go home. Bunyan wouldn't do it. Bunyan refused. And those three months turned all in all into 12 years in prison because he refused to give up 
preaching the gospel. All he had to do was say, I'll stop. And they would have let him go home. Yeah. And as a father, like you and I understand that heart, how hard must that have been to give up to give up your your family for the cause of Christ? Yeah. I mean that's you know, I yeah, to be honest, like I, I would certainly feel conflicted being in, in Bunyan's position mm-hmm. because on the one hand, right, you and I are pastors. We are called to be ministers of the gospel, and that is our primary responsibility and our primary duty. Right. And if we were put in a situation where it was, hey, preach the gospel, you go to prison, I think you and I without question would say, well, of course we're going to preach the gospel. Right. Uh, but you and I are both also husbands and fathers yeah, and we have responsibilities and duties to our wives and, and our children. Yeah. Um, and that's where the conflict would be for me. If it comes to preaching the gospel or not, of course there's no question, but if it comes to, I may go to prison and that means I can't fulfill my responsibilities to my wife and my children. I mean, the, there would be a conflict of conscience at this yes, point because absolutely because my conscience compels me to fulfill my responsibility to to my family but at the same time my conscience compels me to regardless of what may come to preach the gospel right now he was blessed his wife was an advocate for him she was constantly saying that he is preaching the right gospel yeah. and she was constantly being an advocate for him of course she was a woman at a time where women had no voice and right, had no real right. so you know although she spoke powerfully and although she spoke frequently uh at the end of the day it, it fell on deaf ears yeah but for 12 years bunyan was imprisoned and while he was in prison now i will say this he did have a, a blessing in that uh, there was a, a sympathetic jailer who john you know he didn't stop preaching the gospel he preached the gospel in the prisons to everybody there you know yeah. could, jailers and prisoners alike everybody in that prison heard the gospel right cuz what are they going to do at that point Jesus. right yeah throw what are they going to do <laughs> they can't throw him in a prison again you know right. he's already there you know and so they can't shut this guy up He recognizes they're not going to be able to prohibit me in here. He takes full advantage of it. Now, there is a sympathetic jailer who is seeing and hearing Bunyan. And so this jailer actually did, every so often, he would let Bunyan go at night. And he would be able to go home and he'd be able to see his family. Because he knew Bunyan would return the next morning. Right, right. Uh, He knew the character of John and and so that did happen. Now, eventually, the the jailer was discovered, uh, and he was told to stop, and he was reprimanded for it. And so that did end. But there was a time where, where even in that, you see the the providence of God, the hand of God, in, in how right. Bunny is being treated. It's while he's in prison for those twelve years that Bunyan writes the Pilgrim's Progress. Wow. And so it's during that time that while he is while he is seeing that the gospel needs to be proclaimed with clarity and with accuracy, and it needs to be in contradiction to all the false religions and all the false ideologies and all the wrong things that are going on, it's during that time that he writes this on the nose journey of Christian on his way to the celestial city. Yeah. And so I do think that his circumstances even influenced it. That No, I'm not going to hide a thing. Christian is going to be his name. Right, and he right. is going to encounter people called worldly wise. He's going to encounter people named ignorant. He's going to be in a castle called despair. He's going to be in all these places. Right. And I want you to know exactly what I'm saying. And uh, and so it's it's very it's a very fun read. Oh, absolutely! It's a very fun read. Now, once he publishes Pilgrim's Progress, it's almost an instantaneous success, uh, and he becomes a bit of a celebrity even before uh, uh, you know while he's still alive. He becomes yeah. uh, a celebrity, and it's 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 a it's a wonderful and an incredible book. 
that helps us recognize the truth of the gospel and how it impacts our lives no matter what comes in our journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there were several instances while we were recording this book that, uh, you know, as we would read through it, it just, you know, it just spoke so clearly, you know, to me as I'm as I'm listening to you read and as I'm reading along uh, uh, with you, there were several moments where I just want to throw my hands up and just yeah. scream like, uh, that was incredible. Like yeah. just the way he explained that, the way he expounded on, on the human experience, the Christian experience. I mean, it's, uh, you know, not that I'm a super you know, learned individual, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think I've read anything that was as, uh, uh, or really as fantastic or incredible as, as this book. It, it has stood the test of time. Absolutely. It has absolutely stood the test of time. And, um, and I think that's a testimony to, to, to how clear Bunyan wanted to make it. Right. And just how precise he wanted to make it. And even though we don't go on a journey like Christian does in the book, we all recognize pretty quickly that you no, know, but we are on a similar journey where right. we encounter all kinds of other things. Yeah, and uh, it's it is a it's a testimony to his writing, and it's a testimony to uh, the immediate understanding how needed this kind of a, a, a narrative was. Right. Right. Um, and so, this book did though, as we were going through it and as we were reading it, this book posed some unique challenges at least for us you know it might not be for other oh, people who do audiobooks but it did for us it was it was a bit different yeah especially compared to on the incarnation which we did back in december yeah yeah and and as we kind of close out this this introduction to the book and this introduction to to bunyan i did want to take a, a just a few minutes just to talk about just a couple of things pertaining to uh kind of our approach to to recording this book now now like you said there are some big differences between this and and on the incarnation uh one is the size of the book mm-hmm. you know uh, on the incarnation, I think it was seventy-two pages. That's something, the something like that's that. the number I remember. Uh, we'll see if that's the case. We'll go look it up later yeah. and find out. But uh, you know, this one was about one hundred and sixty pages, yeah. so you know, it was over double the length. Yeah. Uh, but then not only that, you know, this is you know, on on the incarnation was was a nonfiction book. Yeah. You know, it was it was an informative sort of writing style, right. whereas this is, it's a narrative. This, this is a story. And so, uh, th- there's a drama that's taking place as, as this, the story is unfolding. And then not only that, there's, there's several different characters that we meet Lots in, in the them. book. And one of the things we, um, we had kind of discussed as we were getting ready to start recording this book was, was this issue of having different characters and potentially doing different voices for these characters. Now, I think that people who know you will be able to recognize that, oh, this is Josh doing different voices. But yeah. uh, in case anyone did not know that, uh, this is Josh, just one person doing all these different voices. Yes. We didn't hire any voice actors. We didn't have different people reading different yeah. portions of the book. It was, it, was, it was out of the budget this time around. Right. right yeah, book. absolutely. Maybe next time. Maybe maybe, maybe, maybe so. when we get one of those those big movie deals or, yeah, or something it, like big uh, big budget deals. But uh, um you know, this was something that that you had kind of uh, said that that you were interested in in doing, and then uh, certainly from a production standpoint, there really was no other way for us to to do it other than doing it with these voices. And so, why don't you tell us real quick just why uh, why personally you felt like yeah. this was something you wanted to do? Yeah. Well, even though I've read and reread this book year after year, I've only ever read it out loud one time before this and it was with uh, my kids every right. night I read to them before they go to bed and and the particular book we read this has been a few years ago now was Pilgrim's Progress yeah and I read and I because I'm reading to the kids I do it with different voices every single character has a unique little voice and so I read it and and the voices for my children and even for me and and to my for my wife who is there as well when I read, the voices make these stories come alive in a way that you just don't get if if you're reading it straight. Yeah. Um, and and even still, my little boy will sit down and he'll read a book to me. He's learning how to read and he's doing really well. But even still, he'll read a book and then he'll hand me the book after. He'll say, "Daddy, will you read this with the voices?" Yeah, and I'll go and I'll read the voices. It adds an element to storytelling, and it seemed like it was appropriate since this was because of the literary history we've talked about, because of the significance of it in Christian literature. 
let's let's make the story come alive as much as possible. Yeah. And so let's add different voices. Try to make them as unique as the characters themselves. And so that's that was it was a, a fun task for me to be able to try and work through yeah. these uh, as we were going through the book. Yeah, and so you know, like I say, there's it was just kind of natural for you to to read it this way because this is how you have read it out loud uh, before. Right. But then, like you said, it really makes uh, the characters come alive in a way that it just doesn't if you just kind of read it straight through. Um, and I'm sure anyone who has kids can can sympathize with the fact that when you read them books, you do read in different voices, whether mm-hmm. you try or not. Um, my uh, my oldest son Jude has a uh, has a a book, uh, a, a small little kids book about Batman. And from the first time we got that book, I exclusively read that book in a Batman voice. You know, I kind of channel the real. Grew up voice like this. You got to. You know, channeling my inner Christian Bale. Right. And I remember, you know, this was before he started talking. The one one time he went and grabbed that book and he, you know, he still had a pacifier in his mouth, but he opened that book and he opened it and started going, "Ah, ah." (laughs) you know what I mean? And so, you know, as parents, we can recognize that like, no, kids enjoy it when when these things and, and actually it makes it way more memorable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, that was kind of a, you know, like I said, it was just much more natural for you to do it that way. But also from a production standpoint, there was really no other option for us except to do different voices. And that's something we realized real quickly as we got into this book. Um, if you download a copy of this book, you can go to uh, monergism.com and they actually have a, a pretty vast library of over 600 books from, yeah. from church history that for you free. can download for free. Fantastic resource. I have uh, a lot of the books I have read have come from this website and actually the, the, the the copy that we use, the edition that we used actually came from monergism.com. Yeah. And if you download this book and you actually, uh, my suggestion would be that as you listen to the book to read along yeah. uh, as it's being read to you. But what you'll see if, if you look at this book is that there are portions of the dialogue that are laid out like a script. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in most sort of fiction books or even nonfiction books, I, I guess maybe. No, probably just in fiction books. Whenever you have characters speaking, there's always a narrative that is driving the conversation. So it will say, you know, something along these lines. As Drew sat down in his chair and pulled the mic up to his face, he began to say to Josh. And then it'll have the quote of what mm-hmm. I said to you. And then it'll say, you know, and then it'll have some quotes from Josh, you know, and then it'll say Josh replied to Drew, yeah. you know, as he sat in his chair. Uh, but, but this portions of this book aren't laid out like that. Uh, Like I say, it's laid out like a script. It'll just have a name and then it'll just have a box of of words that that character said. And really what we realize is that if there's no voice distinguishing which character is which, we're not really going to know who's saying what. And as we recorded, there actually were times where we we had to pause and go, okay, who's saying this Mm -hmm. right now? We had Mm -hmm. to kind of back up and see, oh, you know, talkative is, is talking right now. So, so yeah, we got to use the talkative voice. Right. And so from a production standpoint, we recognize that if, if people are going to follow the story and if they're going to be able to distinguish between these characters, we have to provide them some distinction. Yeah. And the best way to do this by giving them different voices. Yeah. Another difficulty I know for me personally was there at the end of several chapters and even in the middle of some chapters, there's some songs. Right. And, right. uh, and you know, we, we talked about it early on, Hey, do we sing these or do we talk them out? What do we do? And, yeah. uh, and we came to the realization, you know, it, it says he sang, let's sing it. And so what we did is we, we sang these songs to the tune of amazing grace or, you know, be thou my vision or, yeah. or, or familiar hymn melodies. And it just had, Pilgrim's Progress lyrics. Right, right. And that was, like you say, from a production standpoint, it was tough when we got to those. It's like, okay, it says that Christian sang. And I think the first song we we encounter in the book is is after uh, his burden falls off at the cross. Yeah, it's early on. I think that might be right. Um, and we, we kind of questioned for a second, well, it says he sang, are we going to sing? And we kind of went back and forth for a little bit and we decided, well, if it says he sang, then we need to sing. Yeah. That's the best option. And and then, you know, once we kind of nailed that down, okay, we're going to sing this. How do we do it? (laughs) Right, exactly. That was the question. How do we sing this? And, and that's something we, we kind of, you know, quickly realize is that we can, we can actually sing these songs using familiar melodies. And 
you know, the, as we kind of did that, I, you know, I, I kind of realized that this actually may be more significant than we realize. Mm-hmm. And the reason I say that is, you know, um, Bunyan obviously um, put songs into his book. Uh, there's no indication that Bunyan was a musician or that he was a songwriter or no, singer or yeah, anything like that. Um, and even as we look at scripture, right, we see several instances of uh, of people in the scriptures having an encounter with God, God doing something incredible in their lives, and they are driven to sing. They're driven to song. Yeah, and I'm immediately drawn to the Israelites at the part right. of the Red Sea, and when yeah. their sea was closed back up, and Pharaoh's army is is underneath, crushed under the water. You know, right. they sing a song. Right, they sing a song. Uh, Miriam at different points sings a song. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, the Magnificat of, yeah. of Mary is, is another one. There's no indication that these biblical characters were were singers or musicians in in, in any sense. And yet, when they uh, encountered the God in these in these incredible ways, they still sang. Yeah. And you know, I don't know exactly what that looked like, but I can imagine that the way that happened was they, as the song sort of welled up in their in their hearts. Uh, they just sort of came out to tunes that were familiar. I don't yeah. know what that tunes would have been. And I might be wrong about that. That may not be the case, but certainly as a musician, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've been playing music for the majority of my life. I lead worship here at the church. Um, I'm a terrible songwriter. I can't write songs. Um, I've written maybe three songs in my life. That's mm-hmm. just because I can't finish them. To be honest, I start a song and I say, I can't, I don't know what to do next. And it's just a half, right. half of an idea that just gets stuck there. But, um, and, and so even as a musician, I know it's difficult to write songs and yet we see songs being such a significant part of the lives of people who walk with God. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, in some ways I felt like what, what we're essentially doing by singing these songs with familiar melodies is we're almost, we're almost giving an okay for everyday Christians to basically write their own songs in their lives for, for them to encounter God in particular ways in their lives and, and for it to be okay for them to basically take familiar melodies and write, and write new songs. Yeah. And so, you know, it kind of just, it kind of just happened this way. This is kind of just the way it worked out. But, but I think it's, I think it's a good lesson for all of us that we should not neglect the power of song. And we sh- certainly should not neglect to sing the praises of God when, um, I mean, quite frankly, he's always do praises, but when he particularly moves and acts in our lives in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, I think it's important for us to sing these songs, even though we may not have the musical background or something to really, really express them in song. But I think it's okay for us as Christians to take familiar tunes, uh, songs we normally sing and to say, you know what, Uh, I'm going to sing a new song. I'm going to use these melodies and I'm going to sing a new song. Yeah. And so those were, you know, those were a couple of, those were a couple of rough, rough things to kind of work through. But I think the, uh, the end product we came to was, was, was really something, something great. And I've, I've really enjoyed this project a lot. Uh, I have loved coming in here and, and, and recording, doing some very silly voices, doing some voices that were, um, that were maybe, uh, uh, might draw a smile, you know, when you hear them, it does for me every time I hear it still. Um, but it's been a fun project for me coming to the songs and, and us, you know, trial and erroring, which hymn will work with this set of lyrics. And we'd sing it together. And we, no, that didn't work. You know, right, do right. Pace. Yeah, this has been a really fun project. I have enjoyed uh, working through this book and 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 you know kind of experiencing it you know kind of fresh and new again this year but right, also this right. is a whole new process for me as well working and walking through it in this way uh, and so I have loved going through Pilgrim's Progress uh, I look forward to discussing uh, more elements of it in in future uh, sessions where we'll kind of sit down and talk about the good guys and the bad guys and the where's and the who's and the why's and and all yeah, those sorts yeah. of things uh, and I cannot wait uh, to see how the Lord guides us in the future We hope that you enjoyed this discussion of the Pilgrim's Progress, and we hope that it has been edifying to you and your walk with Christ. 
Now this conversation is by no means exhaustive, so we pray that our discussion leads to meaningful conversations with friends and family as you consider what it means to be a pilgrim in this world. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact us at podcasts at northclay.org. For more information from North Clay Baptist Church or from the Ardent Archives, visit our website at www.northclay.org. We look forward to learning with you again soon here on the Ardent Archives.